Welcome to the Real Estate Espresso Podcast, your morning shot of what's new in the world of real estate investing. I'm your host, Victor Manash. This is the weekend edition where we interview notable people from the world of real estate investing. Today is no exception. We have a great guest all the way from just south of Denver, Colorado. Welcome to the show, Scott Saunders. Hey, Victor. Thank you. Great to be with you today. Well, great to have you here. Now, Scott, you've been in this business for, gosh, close to three decades, and you specialize in tax-sheltered exchanges, uh, among other things. And before we get into the details, maybe give a little bit of your back, give a little bit of your backstory and how you got to this point in your journey. Yeah, happy to do that. Well, I got into the 1031 exchange business way back in 1988. So a little over three decades is right. The, the whole industry then was just still evolving. You know, today, 1031 exchanges have become very common, um, both in the commercial and residential sector. I think, uh, a recent report that was just done by ENY showed that something like 20 to 25% of all commercial transactions go through a 1031 exchange now, either on the sale or purchase. So I've kind of grown up in the industry. I'm the former president of the National Trade Organization, and I spend quite a bit of time um, educating people back in Congress on the benefits of 1031 exchanges for the economy, how it stimulates transactional activity and the flow of capital. So pretty involved there working with our government affairs committee. Fabulous. Now, 1031 is one of those things. This is the opportunity, of course, to shelter a capital gain from tax by doing a like exchange into a into an asset uh, that's held for investment. What are the site? What are the types of things that often cause investors to trip up and become disqualified from that sheltering of the capital gains? Uh, one thing right off the bat would be the importance of holding a property for investment purposes. You know, there's a distinction there. If you hold for sale, development, resale, that type of property is excluded from Section 1031 exchange treatment. So you've got to hold for long-term investment, which a lot of times then begs the question that, that we field commonly, which is, well, what's that holding period? How long is that period of time you have to hold it? And surprisingly, there's not a specified time period anywhere in the Section 1031 code. There's not a, a year, a year and a day, 18 months. It, it all comes back to the intent of that real estate investor. So then we literally look back at the facts and circumstances. Do they have factors that show they were really trying to hold it for sale purposes, right? A, a quick turnaround, development, things like that, that are excluded or were they really, did they really have the intent to hold for a long-term investment? So making that distinction, that's that's really critical to make that distinction there. Um, you know, another one just in the marketplace, and, and it's changing, but in the last couple of years, it's been challenging finding replacement properties Absolutely. within that 45 day period. You know, the market in a lot of areas has just been very low on inventory and an investor sells an asset where they have a lot of gain, but now they've got to redeploy it. They've got to identify that within that 45 day identification period. And so finding suitable assets um, has been challenging. Now that Maybe changing a little bit as market conditions are adjusting a little recently, but that's a big factor as well. Absolutely. And I've seen that story play out over and over again, where someone goes out and buys a property that doesn't meet their criteria simply to avoid paying the tax. And then probably a year or two down the road regrets having made that decision. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you talked about dealing in land. So I guess if that gets disqualified, as opposed to getting capital gains treatment, it's treated as ordinary business income, which is, of course, taxed at a much higher rate. And you mm -hmm. talked about the intent, you talked about the hold period, what would be some of the other mitigating factors that would keep you on the right side of that ruling? Um, the thing that you really want to do is create that paper trail. You know, we, we all know that there's going to be an uptick in audits, you know, and we could debate what income levels and what businesses will get audited, but it's pretty clear that we're going to see more audits, you know, on a go forward basis. I think keeping that paper trail, establishing that investment intent, let, let's say you hold land for development and your intent changes, and now you want to hold it for long-term investment. 
there's a recent tax court decision, um, Allen versus the United States, where somebody wasn't able to prove, they weren't able to substantiate when their intent changed. And so I think one takeaway for the audience, Victor, would be create that correspondence, that paper trail. If your intent changes, send an email to your tax attorney, your real estate attorney, to people involved in the transaction saying, hey, we originally bought such and such property for uh, development, but now we're holding for long-term investment. And that way, if you get audited sometime in the future, now you've got a paper trail that you can show the IRS exactly when. And you, and the better you do that, the more robust, the better you'll stand uh, in an audit. And so I think that's something just taking a little time to create that documentation, that paper trail really can make a big difference in the future if the IRS chooses to scrutinize your transaction. That makes an awful lot of sense. Now, there are other sheltering mechanisms that are available. There's the Delaware Statutory Trust. There's other structures out there. You want to talk a little bit about the interplay when these structures might apply? Yeah, sure. The Delaware Statutory Trust is uh, its certainly a vehicle that's out there where people might exchange into it. We've just seen a, a big surge in those types of transactions, particularly investors that maybe want to go more a little bit more passive. Those can be used in kind of two different ways. Maybe you exchange into a, in a Delaware Statutory Trust, a lot of times you're referred to by the initials, a DST. A lot of times people exchange into those with all of their equity. Sometimes an investor might do a 1031 exchange. They sell an asset, let's say for, you know, four or 5 million, they buy a replacement property for only 4 million and they've got that difference left over. And the choice is either, boy, do I want to pay taxes on that? Or maybe take that leftover piece and roll it into a DST and a 1031 exchange. So you pick up a little diversification, you know, maybe you got to pick up a different geographic market and it shelters then all of the gain, right? Now you have a fully deferred exchange because you've redeployed all of the equity. Uh, Keep in mind, you have to have the same or a greater amount of, of aggregate debt also. But that's a way where somebody could take advantage of a vehicle like a a DST is either as a replacement property by itself or with that leftover piece at the, you know, after buying one or two replacement properties and there's a a piece of equity left behind rather than paying taxes to Uncle Sam, why not get that working back into real estate? And DSTs are great because at the very last minute, a lot of them will have, you know, an opening. You say, I've got this much equity and debt. What do you have available? And you can a lot of times go into those pretty close to the end of a 45-day identification period. Now, you mentioned the 45-day period, but there's two time periods that are important with a 1031. There's 45 days and then there's 180 days. So I'm going to hit you cold here with a little bit of a case study specifically okay. around the 180 days. And for the listeners at home, we have not we have not compared notes on this one before, so I'm hitting you with this cold. Imagine for a moment you have a development project and you're going to cover a portion of the 1031 with the purchase of the land, but you hope to get the construction done and ultimately meet the criteria, meet the dollar amount for the 1031. Does that 180 day period come into play for meeting that criteria for the actual construction? Yeah, good, great question. And actually, uh, this one's pretty straightforward in terms of answering. So let me just step back for just a moment. When you close on a property, that stays zero. You have 45 days to identify till midnight of the 45th day. You have another 135 days after that for a maximum of 180. So I want to be really clear. Sometimes people think it's 45 plus 180. It's 180 inclusive, first 45. To answer your question, um, it's very clear on this issue. Only real property um, that is done within the 180-day period qualifies for an exchange. In fact, the Treasury regulations say goods and services to be produced after day 180 are not considered like-kind property. And so, you know, particularly now with, you know, construction delays and supply chain, it's become, you know, a little bit more challenging for those. You don't have any leeway. The IRS says the timeline is statutory, 180 days. So only real property that is actually improved within that 180-day period qualifies. You can't just 
send the money on over to the builder and have that done in the future. So that, that's the issue. That's what's called an improvement or a construction or a build to suit exchange. They're a great vehicle, Victor. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people maybe want to roll out of an asset and build something that's substantially bigger, right? I'm selling for $3 million. I'm going to buy, uh, build an $8 million building. You only need to have $3 million done within the 180 days. So you don't have to have a certificate of occupancy or a completed building, just improve real property. So I buy the dirt for a million, I get $2 million worth of improvements done within that 180 days. They get 100% tax deferral in that situation. So you've got to show the draw schedule to the IRS and demonstrate that the, that lumber got put in the project. It just wasn't sitting in a pile on the sidewalk beside the building. Absolutely. Very key to do that. Yep. And keep in mind with that format, by the way, your requirement to identify is a little more stringent. So when you identify an improvement exchange, you identify the dirt and also the building plans are included with it. So if you say you're going to build an apartment and you actually end up building a shopping center, well, that's not the same thing that you identified. So the the actual letter, the, the text of the law says in as much detail as is practicable at the time you identify. So normally plans, you know, here's the here's the parcel and here are the plans with it. Normally that's, you know, reasonable and you can do running construction changes, right? If you have a plan for, uh, you know, a roof and you change the pitch of it or the siding, that's not material. So that stuff is certainly allowed. Sure, sure. Fabulous. Often investment projects end up being syndications where you get multiple investors investing in a single entity. That means investing in shares or membership in, in, in a limited liability company. That's not the same thing as property. So you sell that property, that entity sells the property, those investors are now joined at the hip. They are married forever if you want to go into a 1031 exchange. Are there other types of structures that offer a little bit more latitude so that investors can go their own separate ways um, post-sale of a property? Are, is this worth talking and thinking about in advance of closing on a deal? It, it absolutely is, Victor. Uh, a lot of people hold title in different entities, right? Partnerships, LLC, syndications. First off, it's really easy if the entire partnership, let's say, wants to exchange. So if all of the partners want to exchange, the partnership sells the asset to a buyer and the entire partnership does the 1031 exchange. So any entity can do an exchange, whether it's a partnership, LLC, S Corp, C Corp, trust. Where things get stickier is if I've got a partnership, let's say with 40 partners, and 25 of them want to exchange, 15 want to just receive the money. The code is really clear. You cannot do a 1031 exchange on a partnership interest. It's prohibited. So you can't do an exchange there. But there are a couple of workarounds, uh, a couple of ways to approach this in a 1031 exchange context. One is what we call a swap and drop approach. So the partnership sells the asset, buys a replacement property, and after the exchange is over, disperses to those 15 former partners' uh, interest in it. Now, that sounds good on the surface. It really works much better with two, three, four partners, you know, closely held partnership. It's not going to work for a partnership with 40 partners. By far, the more common approach is to do what is called a drop and swap. So in a drop and swap, the partnership elects to no longer be a partnership, and they actually deed out of the partnership to now the 40 former partners where they're tenant and common co-owners. Now that they own an interest in real property directly rather than an interest in a partnership that owns real property, now those that want to exchange can do a 1031 exchange on their respective interest. And those that sell at the closing receive the cash, which becomes taxable. But there's one area to, to keep in mind. The earlier you can do this, the better it is. Um, it's not advisable or it certainly is riskier to do this right before closing. So if you can plan in advance, drop out and season it for a period of time where you hold title as tenant common co-owners, that's much, much better. Uh, you know, here in in the states, uh, one particular state has taken a really aggressive position on challenging these, and that's the state of California. So the maximum tax rate there is 13.3%, and they're aggressively going after 
swap and drops, uh, drop and swaps, where somebody did that right before closing or right afterwards. And they're actually winning and they're collecting state taxes owed. So the earlier you can structure that, the better it is. The closer to your closing date, the more risky it becomes. Now, presumably, even if it's for the same, let's say, um, ownership base, would some jurisdictions that have the notion of land transfer tax, would that trigger a land transfer tax? No, it does not. Okay. No. Fascinating. Well, Scott, if folks want to connect, if they want to learn more, what's the best way? Yeah, they can uh, reach out toll-free number at 800-282-1031. Uh, the website is a pi exchange.com awesome well scott love the perspective this is an important topic and after the run-up that we've had in prices over the last couple of years i imagine there's a lot of folks staring down the barrel of a 1031 opportunity or paying the tax so definitely for the folks at home connect with scott at 1-800-282-1031 or at api exchange.com and in the meantime have an awesome rest of your weekend Go make some great things happen, and we'll talk to you again tomorrow.